Um, earlier in the pandemic, right at the beginning, as we kind of watched uh, from afar as Italy and then Iran and then New York were kind of swept by this new thing that had us all terrified, the uh, now infamous New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, was giving a speech trying to kind of rile his people to knuckle down and get through this new season. And in the speech, he said this just as he was closing. He said, emotion is a luxury that we cannot afford. Let's just get through this. Emotion is a luxury that we can't afford. Coronavirus has come and for the most part gone, but for most of us, I think we kind of want to recognize that emotional dampness isn't just our kind of British stoic response to a global crisis. For a lot of us, it is our natural state of being. For a lot of us, emotion feels like a luxury that we can't afford. Blaise Pascal once wrote that the true test of a man is whether he can sit alone in a quiet room with his thoughts. What he meant by that wasn't, can you be peaceful? He meant, can you sit for five minutes when all the reality of life comes and you're not distracted by anything and actually get through. When you take two minutes away from stuffing ourselves full of distractions, do we have the resources to truly confront the reality of life? Well, we come today in our series uh, in the Psalms on what prayer looks like in the Psalms to Psalm 42. And Psalm 42, in the language of our friend in the advanced movement, Alan Frau, speaks to our saturated souls. And I'll, I'll get to what he means by that in a minute. But first, it's, it's right for me to say that uh, much of what we're going to look at together today is from uh, Alan Frau. He wrote this little book called Psalms for the Saturated Souls, Psalms for a Saturated Soul. And uh, yeah, we recommend that book to you. It's, it's a wonderful little book. Uh, really helpful for us in this specific kind of post-COVID moment. Um, but that being said, Psalm 42 speaks so clearly to our times. I think you look across the landscape of our lives and the coronavirus really exposed something. Most of us fail Blaise Pascal's test. Most of us don't have the emotional capacity to engage with God in the midst of crisis. Far from kind of this emotional capacity, this emotional health that means we can sit with the difficult realities of life and still praise God, most of us are used to just stuffing ourselves fuller and fuller and fuller of distractions to escape reality. You know, I read this week about uh, this idea of a show hole. I don't know if you've heard of that phrase, show hole. It's the, the gaping feeling you have when you finish binge watching a show on Netflix and you don't have another one to fill the hole. And it isn't just Netflix. We're the first people in history to have 24-hour news. We're the first to have constant online connectivity. We have completely normalized instant gratification in every sphere of our lives. We're not used to sitting and just being in the reality of life. All of this adds up to one thing. We are oversaturated and we are numb. We're overstuffed and we're unable to feel fully. Our emotional and our spiritual arteries are clogged with fat. We're more full of Netflix and scrolling than we're able to just sit in the reality of life in its goodness and its hardships. But if you're a Christian here today and you believe that God created your emotions, it's important that we learn to reconnect emotionally, not just with God, but with life day to day. British Stoicism is not the road to emotional health. It's not the road to flourishing. In fact, the writer and pastor Pete Schizero writes this. He writes it really simply. He says, we cannot become spiritually mature if we remain emotionally immature. So the question that we want to answer from Psalm 42, how do we reconnect with God in prayer at the emotional level when our souls are both somehow thirsty for God and yet stuffed full of all the wrong things? How do we reconnect with God in prayer? Well, we're going to see three 
things that the psalm would lead us to do. Number one, pour out our souls. Number two, listen to our souls. And number three, speak to our souls. First, pour out your soul. I wonder if you ever come home from a holiday or sit down after the Christmas season and think, oh my goodness, like I need to stop eating so much crap. I need to just have a good drink of water and like go on a juicing diet for a week. Like I need to flush this system out. I don't know what's in there anymore. We tend to look after a really unhealthy season to flush our system of junk. The first thing the psalmist seems to do is to flush his spiritual system of junk. He pours out his soul. He detoxes his clogged up spirit. Have a look again at the beginning of this psalm. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water. So my soul pants for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. He goes on, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. He also goes on to say, my tears have been my food day and night. For the writer of this poem, his life is the cycle. He spends his time crying and drinking his tears and his tears are so salty that they make him more thirsty and he he keeps crying and there's this just cycle of being unable to satisfy his longing. He's like a sailor desperate for a drink and taking a cup of seawater and drinking it and he's just more thirsty. His thirst seems like the kind of thirst when you wake up at 3 a.m. after a Chinese and it's like your whole body has shriveled up. Like somehow there's so much salt in salt and chili chicken that it absorbs all the moisture in your body and all you need is a drink. He's so thirsty and nothing can quench his thirst. This is someone well versed in the reality of pain and longing. In fact, we we use this phrase in a positive way, but I think when he paints this picture of deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, that he's not being nice. It's not a nice thing. It's a picture of pain. He's like a surfer caught under an undercurrent and he, he can't get up and the waves just keep crashing over him. He can't get a break. He can't get air. You know, it reminds me of the time I almost died in a kayak. Like, I say that and you probably think, this guy's adventurous. He doesn't look like a rugged outdoorsman. And you'd be right because I almost died in a kayak in the shallow end of a swimming pool. (laughs) I was uh, at an intro to kayaking course and all the experts were flirting with each other or something at the other end of the pool and I tipped and the thing caught and I couldn't get out and I did just start to drown. And uh, I could almost touch the bottom of the pool with my head, which is really humiliating. And out the corner of my eye, I genuinely was starting to pass out. At the corner of my eye, my friend dived in and flipped me over. And uh, that was the last time I went to Dundee Uni Canoe Club. <laughs> but there's, there's a terrible feeling. There's a point. There's a point. It's, it's a funny story, but there's a point. There's a terrible feeling when you genuinely cannot get a, a, a breath of air. There's a minute where you think, oh, okay, I'm going to flip. And then you think, no, this is real. This is real. The water will not get away from me. Unlike me, as I saw my friend diving in out the corner and coming to my rescue, the psalmist doesn't see anybody coming. All your waves and your breakers have crashed over me, he says. My soul is downcast within me. That mention he makes of the heights of Hermon, Mount Mazar, is either just a metaphor or a reality, but all it's saying is this, he's far from God. Mount Mazar is a long way from Jerusalem. It's important that we see this. This isn't somebody that is an unbeliever. Somebody who we would say, oh, you just, you just need to come and find God and everything will be okay. This is someone that knows God. He writes in the Psalm that he used to be a worship leader used to lead people as they went up to the temple in praise. And yet now, he's far from God, thirsty. He feels abandoned and alone, at a distance from God. 
This is what St. John of the Cross used to call the dark night of the soul. It's a season in our lives when our experience of God feels more like absence than presence. More like absence than presence. I wonder whether you can relate to that. Has there been a season of your life when God felt more distant than he did near? You were doing all the right things, you were praying, you were reading the Bible, but God just didn't seem to show up. Perhaps you're going through that now. All of us at some point or another will feel this Psalm 42 longing for God. So the question is, is there a practice of prayer that can help us to re-engage with God in the dark night of the soul? Is there a practice to help us to pour out our water-clogged souls? I think that practice is lament. Central to this psalmist practice of prayer is to live like a deer. What do I mean by that? Derek Kidner, in his commentary on the psalm, makes this really interesting observation. He says, Psalm 42 is not the prayer of a camel. It's the prayer of a deer. He means camels, when they're in the desert, they're solitary and self-sustaining, and they get through. And some of us wish we could live a camel life spiritually, that we could just stock up ourselves with God and then go off into the desert and everything will be okay. We'll knuckle down and get through. The psalmist chooses the life of a deer, a deer that thirsts for water, that doesn't stop until he finds it. Jesus put it this way in his most famous sermon. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not blessed are those who knuckle down when they're thirsty, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, in the place of numbness and distance and absence, we are blessed, in Jesus' words, when we embrace our thirstiness when we embrace our thirstiness, not when we become self-sufficient. And from that place of thirst, we learn to pour out our souls in lament. The writer Henry Nouwen puts it wonderfully. He says, I have found that much of prayer is grieving. This grief is so deep, not just because the human sin is so great, but also and more so because the divine love is so boundless. Now, in a saying this, that the depths of our despair reach out to the depths of God's love when we pray from a place of thirstiness for him. In the words of our psalm, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. In God, we find a love that is boundless enough to hold our junk. No matter what we bring, he has the resources to handle it. In fact, the Bible says he loves to hear you pour out your soul. Psalm 56, verse 8 says this, You keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all of my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. God doesn't get tired of hearing you cry out to him. He doesn't get tired of you telling him how you feel. He writes it down. He keeps it in his diary. He stores them up. He treasures your tears. So pour out your soul. God will collect your grief and your tears. They are not wasted. He'll even collect the numbness and the apathy. When you can't cry, when you can't pray, he collects everything that you bring to him. Pour out your soul. Second, the psalmist listens to his soul. Have a look at verse 5 turns and he speaks to himself, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you in turmoil within me? Abby likes to tell the story of when she was nine and she broke her arm at the playground. She went home and, bad news, her mum was out at small group. And so she only had her dad to rely on with a broken arm. And he wet a cloth under the sink and put it on her arm. And they knuckled down until mum came home. Just total misdiagnosis of the problem. 
Imagine even worse than that, if Abby had come home with a broken arm and her dad had said, don't worry, I forgive you. I forgive you. Just take a seat. It's going to be okay. I forgive you. Or imagine an unfaithful spouse who comes clean to her husband. Her husband goes and gets the car and throws his wife in the back and drives to A&E and says, we need some treatment, please. We need to heal this. She doesn't need healing. She needs forgiveness. If you have a broken arm, you don't need forgiveness. You need a cast. You definitely don't need a damp cloth. So we, we don't want to confuse sins and wounds. We don't want to misdiagnose what is going on in our hearts. You know, in the spiritual life, it's important that we don't confuse sins and wounds. Next week, Matt's going to preach from Psalm 51, where we really explicitly see a prayer of repentance. A prayer where David knows he has done wrong and he needs forgiveness, but this is not one of those prayers. Psalmist looks inwards in Psalm 42 and says, Why are you downcast? What is wrong with you? He listens to his soul and he digs around for the root of the problems, for the thing behind the thing. You know, if this poet were just to jump straight to sin and presume he'd done something wrong and just ask God for forgiveness, he would miss God's healing work in his life. So we need to be aware of the reality of wounds, what others have done to us. Not just sins that we have committed. Because we can't repent of wounds. Thank you. I know I'm getting animated, thank you. We can't repent of wounds, but we do still come to God with our wounds. We do still come to God with our wounds. The Greek word for salvation in the New Testament, if you read the Gospels, is so-so. And that word doesn't just mean salvation, it actually means healing as well. In English, we have two words. We have the word I save and the word I heal. If you read the Gospels and Jesus says something like your faith has healed you, the word is the same. Your faith has saved you. It's the same word. In fact, the English word salvation comes from the Latin word salve, which is an ointment that you put on a burn wound. I wonder if you see, Jesus is never only the one who forgives our sins. He's also the one who heals our, our hearts, our wounded, weary souls. You know, we come together on a morning like this from different weeks, from different lives, different families, different backgrounds. We don't only come with sins that need forgiven. We come with baggage. In this room, we come with family issues from broken homes. We come betrayed. We come stinging from divorce or unfaithfulness. And God's healing, saving presence <clears throat> greets us not just as sins forgiven this morning, but as wounds healed. It's an important step in our discipleship then to go on a process of self-discovery, of learning to identify our wounds, to actually answer the question, why, my soul, are you downcast? Christian church has long taught that knowledge of self and knowledge of God are inseparable. St. Augustine famously prayed, Lord, let me know myself that I might know you. John Calvin kicks off his Institutes of the Christian Religion with this belter. He says, without knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom, consists almost entirely of two things, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. In other words, central to knowing and loving God is learning to know ourselves, our sins, our wounds, and our weaknesses. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why, my soul, are you downcast? As we go deeper in God, we learn to answer that question for ourselves in prayer. How do we do that? How do we listen to our souls? Just before we move on, here's a few quick suggestions. Number one, ask God. Ask God. Psalm 139 says this, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus taught that God knows the exact number of hairs on your head. He knows when one of your hairs falls out. He is intimately aware of you. The beginning of learning to diagnose our wounds is to ask God to reveal them to us. Ask God, ask others. We're a gift of God's grace to each other. I can't tell you the number of times that a searching question from a friend or a blunt statement from Abby has just been a moment of good, holy exposure of what was really going on in my heart. A word of warning, it's a sensitive thing to speak into someone's life. Be careful who you invite into that level and be careful not to speak into someone's life when they haven't invited you to, but we want to be more and more a community that knows each other, that speaks to each other, that says, I think this is what is going on with you. If you don't have that, it'd be a good thing this week to pray Lord, would you give me someone in my life that can look into my soul and speak to it? And then with serious caution, and hear that, consider using self-awareness tools. Myers-Briggs Strength Finder, the Enneagram, these are only tools. And the best model is only ever a pale imitation of the actual mess and complexity of a human heart. But if you use them with caution, it can be helpful. Just to get a bit of insight, who am I, what drives me? Not just what am I good at, but where am I tempted to sin? What is my kind of, what is my mess? What do I need help with? It's good to know. So those are three quick suggestions. Ask God, ask others, cautiously use tools. Self-awareness is not something for hippies. It is a gift from God that we shouldn't hide away from under the guise of knowing God. I'm just so focused on him, I don't need to think about myself. You disagree with most of Christian history if you think that. Pray with St. Augustine, Lord, help me know myself so that I might know you. And then speak to your soul, why are you downcast? Learn to answer that prayer. So I pour out my soul says the psalm. Then he looks at himself and says, why are you so downcast? But now he turns to the most important step. He doesn't just listen to himself in a sort of quasi-progressive therapy session. He fixes his sights on his soul. and He says, dear soul, I know you feel that way. But let me tell you how it is. Let me tell you how things actually are he engages in a stern, frank, real conversation with his own soul. He turns to our final step. He speaks to his soul. Have a look at verse 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You know, if we were to stop now, If we were to stop halfway at just self-exploration, we would be in very dangerous territory. Pouring out and listening to our souls isn't enough because what we think is our authentic selves can't be trusted all the time. We're not always right. We need the rock-solid truth of God to ground and anchor our always-moving souls. Some have put it this way, emotions are a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. The uh, famous Welsh preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, put it this way. He said, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? In Psalm 42, we catch a glimpse of what it maybe would look like to speak back to the waves and the whims of our souls. Turn to your wounded, weary soul and command it. Put your hope in God. How do we do this? Well, one simple way is to answer back with the word of God to specific lies that you're believing. We take our example from Jesus who was in the wilderness and he resisted temptation not by conjuring up some kind of smart one-liner, but by clinging to what God had already said in his word. 
Here's an example. We might start with asking ourselves, what lie am I believing? And we're honest. We do the first step. We pour out our souls. We tell God, God, I believe that you don't love me. Pour out your soul. And then we turn and we ask, what does God in the Bible say to this lie? Write down what God says and then speak it aloud to yourself. We might come to God one day and say, Lord, I've been hurt by people. And I don't think I'll ever be loved. We spend some time just telling God what that's like. And then in response, we might go to 1 John 3.16 and read this aloud. This is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for me. And then pray, Lord, I feel unloved and unlovable, but you have loved me eternally. You get the final say, not me. Soul, put your trust in God. Ultimately, this is not just a kind of cognitive behavioral therapy for spiritual people. This is us speaking our souls back to Jesus Christ. He is the truth of God. You know, we saw earlier that deep calls to deep, the depths of our despair, meeting the depths of God's love and prayer. If that is to happen, our saturated and wounded souls have to look to Jesus. and Our wounds have to meet his wounds. We have to look to him. Come back to Alan Frow. He says this, the truest Thing about you is not what has been done to you, but what has been done for you. Hey, let's add to that. The truest thing about you is not what has been said about you, but what God has spoken over you. The truest thing about you is not how you've been wounded, but the one who has been wounded for you. Edward uh, Shalito was a World War I soldier and he was in the trenches. He saw woundedness and horror all about him and he wrote this poem. We know nothing about him other than this poem. Here's the final verse. The other gods were strong, but you were weak. They rode, but you stumbled to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. Not a God has wounds, but you alone. To our weary and wounded souls, the wounds of Christ speak. The boundless love of God that meets us in the depths of our longing is found fully and completely in Jesus. He willingly let the breakers and the waves of God's anger crash over him. He willingly experienced God more as absence than presence. He was wounded for us. Hanging on a cross, he said, I thirst. I thirst. Friends, pour out your soul. Listen to your soul, but most importantly, command your soul. Look to Jesus. Look to the wounded, suffering servant hanging on a cross, thirsting for his Father's presence for me. Look to the cross where God himself thirsted, where God himself hung dying so that you don't have to thirst any longer. Turn to your soul and say, look to Jesus. Look at his wounds, out of his wounds, flows the healing salve for our wounds. Jesus is the one who meets us in the depths of our longing. To our thirsty, saturated, water-clogged, broken, wounded souls, Jesus speaks. Here's what he says in the Gospels. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Come to him this morning. Let me pray.